Would you call the roll, please? Robert Krause. Jason Blair. Here. Kathy Griffith. Here. Terry Kavner. Here. David Roberts. Mark Pham. Here. Glenn Lewis. Here. Uh, we have a quorum. Would you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? Item two is a consent docket. Item A is approve the minutes of the regular city council meeting held August 20th, 2012. Item B is receive the minutes of the regular parks board meeting held June 5th, 2012, July 3rd, 2012, and August 7th, 2012. Item C is approve observance of Wednesday, October 31st, 2012, this Halloween trick or treat night. Item D is approve and ratify claims and expenditures for FY 2012, 2013, in the amount of $1,514,294.54. Move to approve. All right, thank you. Second. Thank you. Any other discussion on these items? Any questions to the claims? Any changes or notes to the minutes? If not, we have a motion and a second. Would you call for the vote, please? Jason Blair. Yes. Kathy Griffith. Yes. Terry Kavner. Yes. Mark Ham. Yes. Glenn Lewis. Yes. Item carries. <laughs> Let the minutes reflect that. Councilman Krauss is now here. Item three. I'll give you a minute to set up. We're good. Go ahead. Go ahead. Are you sure? Okay. It's short. I don't nice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Item three is consider <laughs> approval of ordinance number 72412, amending part five, chapter three, article A, section 5 204, by adopting the 2009 International Residential Code. Mayor and Council, uh, this item is updating our current uh, residential code from 2006 to 2009. Uh, we do prefer to stay about three years behind the actual building code um, year and more um, simply just to let the other communities work out the items that may not work um, or that may could be done better. Um, however, this year is a little unusual in that this is our first uh, time that the state of Oklahoma has officially adopted 2009 as a minimum building code standard for the entire state. So we are required now to adopt the 2009, which it was time anyways. Um, the state of Oklahoma does allow the cities to make amendments to the code like we always have done. So the item that you have in front of you does have certain amendments to the code. Um, we did present this to the home builders um, in more um, Two to three times uh, we've talked with them about the different amendments. Uh, we believe that this is a good product that everyone can live with for the next um, several years. And um, I do have Shane Spiegel here tonight. He's our new uh, building official, and he was the one who met with the home builders and the contractors um, to get these items worked out. So if you have any questions, he would be happy to answer them. So we have to adopt it. Uh, yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Make a motion to adopt. All right. Thank you. Second. Thank you. It's not only that we have to, but we need to go ahead and adopt it because we're we're behind what the current building codes minimum standards for the state is, and it has caused a little bit of confusion of late uh, recently in terms of one a subcontractor or builder looking at one code and another one being aware that the state is requiring an updated code. So it just gets us in sync with what the other cities in the metro are doing already. Okay. Do we have a motion and a second? Any other discussion? If not, would you call for the vote? Kathy Griffith? Yes. Terry Kavner? Yes. Mark Ham? Yes. 
Robert Krause? Yes. Jason Blair? Yes. Glenn Lewis? Yes, item carries. Item number four, we've been asked to table this item as consider ordinance number 72612 relating to records and towing services amending part nine, chapter 12 by deleting sections nine through 12 uh, dash 10 entitled parking police. Make a motion to table this item. All right, thank you. Second. Thank you. Uh, would you call for the vote, please? We have a motion and a second. Terry Kavner? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. David Roberts? Yes. Mark Cam? Yes. Robert Krause? Yes. Jason Blair? Yes. Kathy Griffith? Yes. Glenn Lewis? Yes. Item carry, item, item is table, excuse me. Item number five is consider approval of a contract with Vero, Patty Banks and Associates in the amount of 24000 to prepare renderings of improvements proposed in our parks, our future propositions. Mayor, um, what we're asking for here is uh, to approve a contract with the entity, Patty Banks and Associates, was the entity that did our parks master plan. Um, we feel like that we uh, need to be able to visually show, particularly on the proposed new park, which is the general obligation bond issue, we need to be able to <coughs> visually be able to show the uh, citizens and the voters what it is that they're going to be voting on. Uh, it's, um, it is a little bit of an expenditure, but um, we feel strongly that we need to um, inform our citizens about what they're going to be voting on. We'll have a series of public meetings, there'll be some mailings, we'll have brochures printed, a lot of that sort of thing. Um, but um, again, this will allow us to have some, uh, I think it's going to include some video, short video and some uh, renderings and some presentations about what the new proposed park will look like and then some typical renderings of some of the other parks uh, that the improvements that will be proposed in the other parks. As you know, we can't spend money to advocate uh, people or asking people to vote yes on this, but again, we feel that it's our responsibility to inform them of what we're asking them to do. So, Now, um, was this in the original contract <coughs> that we did with them? With them? Yeah. No, sir. Because a long time ago, about 17 years ago, we had a we passed a resolution. The council did that we would actually prefer, if we could, to put out for proposals or bids or whatever preferences to local businesses because we ask our citizens to shop local, and we just felt like we should do the same. Mm -hmm. And people that are members of the chamber, they pay taxes, they pay our water, sewer bills, the whole bit. But we haven't really done that. So should we put this out for proposal? It would be hard for somebody locally. That's my question. Come in behind the, right. what the work they've already done. So uh, I don't think it'd be practical. Okay, because that's a lot of money. That's a new police car. Uh, they, they they worked on the fire department, police department plans too, didn't they? Or no, what? just the, the parks master plan. Okay, I thought they did something else for us too. No. Okay. So I'm just they, throwing it out there. The timing is a, would be a bit of an issue mm -hmm. with that, uh, even yet, uh, even if we would have you know, started that a while ago as far as proposals. They're familiar with, with um, what's being proposed. Um, yeah, the they, the they're ready to go. would be uh, here of one before uh, another group it would be, it'd be very difficult to. That's less than eight weeks away. Okay, my next question goes to Randy. Randy, can we legally do that since it's a preparation for a bond proposal? Yes. Yeah. We can spend the money to do that? Okay. All right. So I have a question. Could you tell me a little bit more about what you get? I mean, I was reading through it and it talks about an aerial view. Is this uh, going to be new aerial views? I, I know, are they going to be old ones? Councilmember Ham, what we'll get are several things. We'll get an uh, aerial view, an angle view, if you will, of the Central Moore Park that shows its major components, the community center, pool, uh, farmer's market, uh, and the amphitheater. We'll also get a, a, a rendering of Parmalee Park, which is a new park, and then we'll also get a rendering of the improvements out at Veterans Park. Uh, and then, as uh, uh, Steve mentioned, we'll also get uh, images of improvements that we'll make to existing parks. As an example, playground, shade structures, 
uh, perhaps walking trails, pavilions, so that people, when they mm -hmm. make a decision about this, it's an informed decision about, okay, these are the kinds of things that we're going to get. It's and, kind of, oh, sorry. It'll take existing aerial photography that they have or that we have, and it'll superimpose a kind of an oblique or a what it would look like maybe if you were flying a plane pretty low and looking at what this community center, pool area, amphitheater area and all that would look like, say from um, Broadway. Now, we saw these pictures, or we saw a picture in a meeting earlier, did we not? No, what Where you saw was, it? no, it, it was On a bubble diagram, but it was straight down and it, right. it wasn't proportioned right. It just basically showed the, the components. Of it. Okay. There was no specificity to it, per se. Okay. Is uh, a fair price, Mr. E, I, I guess? Well, yes. Right? I mean, we, I don't think we would submit anything to you that we didn't think was a fair price. Okay. So. Where is it going to be displayed? What, what are we going to, once we have the... We'll use the diagrams that they um, come up with. We'll use that in the brochures and various things that we uh, have available that we put out to the public in uh, mail outs that we do. We'll okay. use those. Okay. So we'll use the video part of it that'll be on a, on a video that we'll put on Channel 20. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'm still not sure if you put that on a brochure that you're not actually soliciting for the the bid, I mean, uh, for the vote. I think you're looking at more informational, I would think. Kind of we've like we've done informational brochures on all of our bond issues and all the sales tax issues that we've done. Um, again, you have to, there's a line there that you can't cross in terms of uh, asking or encouraging people to vote one way or the other. Um, but we want them to know what the projects are that are proposed. We want them to know what the tax impacts of those projects yeah, are. That's true. We don't want to hide those things yeah. from them or not make them aware of what they are. But the other point is if you draw that, doesn't it have to be just like that when you build it? It's going to be enough of a... I mean, it's a concept. It's going to be a conceptual drawing. It's going to be enough of that to where it's, it's going to be classed enough. down, but it is going to be what we... It is in what we intend to build. Okay. <clears throat> All right. With that, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Right. Thank you. Thank you both. Which call for the vote, please? David Roberts? Yes. Mark Ham? Yes. Robert Krause? Yes. Jason Blair? Yes. Kathy Griffith? Yes. Terry Kavner? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Glenn Lewis? Yes. Item carries. At this time, we we'll recess the city council meeting and convene the more public works authority meeting. Item number six is the consent docket. Item A is receive and approve the minutes of the regular Moore Public Works Authority meeting held August 20th, 2012. <coughs> Item B is approve and ratify claims and expenditures for FY 2012-2013 in the amount of $749,029.24. Make a motion to approve. All right. Thank you. Second. So, thank you. Thank you both. We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion on these items? If not, would you call for the vote? Mark Ham? Yes. Robert Krause? Yes. Jason Blair? Yes. Kathy Griffith? Yes. Terry Kavner? Yes. David Roberts? Yes. Lynn Lewis? Yes, item carries. Item number seven is consider adopting resolution number 23212, establishing the sanitary sewer recoupment district number 2-12 for approximately 51 acres located in the east half of section 19, township 10 north, range 2 west, for construction of a sanitary sewer lift station and force mains. Mayor Council, this item is to provide public sewer to <clears throat> currently undeveloped properties in the general vicinity at, of uh, Southeast 4th Street and Sunny Lane. Uh, the intent is to upgrade a planned lift station that uh, the developer of the Rock Creek addition uh, has for his addition. Uh, the city would plan to um, upgrade that to handle an additional 56 acres of um, developed sewage uh, and construct approximately 2,000 linear feet of 8-inch gravity mains in order to uh, provide sewage to this additional property. Uh, the code does allow for establishment of recoupment districts to basically reimburse the city this cost um, and 
uh, we're asking you to do this basically for two reasons. Uh, one, we do want to, if at all possible, consolidate any lift stations that we have. Uh, we did know that the developer was going to construct this lift station. He needed it to serve his development. Um, but we also know that all of the other property that is included in this proposal would also have to have a list station in order to develop. So instead of having <coughs> several smaller list stations, uh, we do feel like it would be better to have one bigger list station. Um, and the other reason why is it does bring these vacant properties that much closer to development um, if they do have the availability of sewer. Um, it may spur on some development um, with the current property owners. Uh, the total cost of the upgrades to the list station and the gravity mains um, is $116,000, uh, sorry, $116,353, thank you. Um, and as you can see, and I believe I sent out or Mr. Edie sent out a revised resolution on Friday, perhaps. Um, we do propose to split the recoupment district into two separate portions. And there was a page five to your handout that shows all of this in a, in a map, um, which may be easier. Um, so we have a, an A and a B district. Um, the A district is 31 acres, and uh, it does take into account the cost of the list station and the gravity line um, and that will come to a reimbursement to the city of $3,213.43 per acre and this will be paid to the city at the time of development. Um, then we have a second recoupment district that I call B which is actually south of the proposed list station um, and this includes 25 acres and there is no gravity lines being constructed to serve this property because it doesn't need them. Um, so the cost is much less because I did not take that into account. So the cost for that is only $669.48 per acre. And again, that would be payable back to the city um, at the time that this property develops. Uh, so I've included um, everything I could think to include in your packet as to how I came up with these numbers, um, the engineering uh, cost estimates and the construction cost estimates. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. I have a couple. Uh, the first one, is, is, is that an annual payment or when they buy the lot, is it just a one-time payment? It is a one-time payment okay. and it's per acre and it's payable uh, whenever they develop the property. So whenever they file a final plat, I would collect the money and it's handed over to our city uh, clerk. Okay, now the other question I have, that looks like, I, I assume that's Joshua's Landing? Um, that this way? is actually Rock Creek Rock edition, Creek. yes. Okay, now across the street, oh, straight across, then down the road, we have two more of these lift stations, but I don't remember doing an impact fee on those. Uh, no, we did not. We rarely use recoupment districts simply because we don't have the opportunity. Um, this was an opportunity that showed itself to us. Uh, we've only done one other recoupment district ever um, back in the early 2000s. Whose was that? Um, Sasan Magadam, and it was a sewer recoupment district off of uh, oh, Southwest 19th okay. Street. Yeah. It's like, I remember doing one, but I couldn't remember where it was. Or who's and it's it was turned for? out to be pretty successful. He has almost recouped all of his money now. On on this particular one, where we have, I think we have three of those stations. Now, are we gonna are we gonna build one to to eliminate three? Because that's no. what he talked about at the last meeting. Yeah, we, we won't be able to out. eliminate any existing list stations with this. This is really just to prevent having, you know, three or four new list stations. So we can just consolidate them into so one. So the city's still gonna have to do the maintenance on those. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. Because that's what he, the there's, Eagle, a, Eagle told there's a there's an impact fee, fee per lot for the future maintenance of the uh, yes. lift stations that the developer pays. What you're approving tonight is on top of that for additional costs, really that the city is determining that needs to be borne, needs to be expended now to provide 
future sewer to yet undeveloped properties, and those might develop tomorrow or maybe 10 years. I, I and the length of I, this is only 15 years. You and I agree that we hate the lift station. Well, we'd, we'd rather not have them, but <laughs> yes. there's a lot of areas out that, that area, have particularly that can't be developed. Now, when um, Satish was here and gave us the um, <coughs> report on the main, the big lift right. station out there on 34th, it's possible that with whatever improvements we choose there, we may be able to eliminate one or two of those lift stations that are out there okay. currently. That, that's what that's I a thinking. separate issue than this. Right. Okay. Do we have a motion? Make a motion to approve. All right. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any other discussion on this item? <coughs> Not. Robert Krause. Yes. Jason Blair. Yes. Kathy Griffith. Yes. Terry Kavner. Yes. <coughs> yes. David Roberts. Yes. Mark Ham. Yes. Lynn Lewis. Yes. Item carries. At this time, we'll recess the more public works authority meeting and convene the more risk management meeting. Item number eight is accept the minutes of the regular Morris management meeting held August 20th, 2012. Item B is approve and ratify claims and expenditures for FY 2012-2013 in the amount of $228,900.24. Make a motion to approve. All right, thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <coughs> Any other discussion? If not, would you call the vote, please? Jason Blair. Yes. Kathy Griffith? Yes. Terry Kavner? Yes. David Roberts? Yes. Mark Ham? Yes. Robert Krause? Yes. Glenn Lewis? Yes. Item carries. At this time, we'll recess the more risk management meeting and reconvene the city council meeting. Item number nine is new business. Item A is citizens forum for items not on the agenda. There is no one signed up. Anyone like to speak? Come on. <clears throat> Stone. I live at 1104 Northeast 29th and more. I was here two weeks ago and I was supposed to be on my docket. No, sir, not on mine. Okay. Um, at that time, I gave the city attorney 10 copies of an engineer report, too, that you guys were all supposed to have to be able to review before we had this meeting so y'all would know a little bit about what's going on. I don't have one. Sorry. Who did you who did you give your information to? Uh, it was a female lady outside the door here, city attorney. She said. There was no female city attorney. We I okay because I went to the front desk and she said, "Well, you need to take it upstairs." And I said, "Well, can I hand it?" And she said, "Well, I don't know who the lady was, but she was in this we, corner office right outside this, this door." We received it, it, and I think it did go out in. In your mail, I think. We did receive it. But when y'all had your last meeting two weeks ago, on Monday, I think, right. I came in that day and she said, Well, do you want to be on tonight's meeting? And I said, No, 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 no. I want to wait till September 4th so they got a chance to look at that before we had a meeting. Sorry, I don't have it. It wasn't my understanding, uh, Danny, that it was to be on the agenda. We. Uh, is that my understanding that you were going to be here to discuss it? This well, she told me that she would put me on the docket so that we would be ready to go. Well, I, the mayor and or I make those decisions, not whoever it is you spoke to. But again, we're <coughs> sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so does anybody have that? Yep, we have it. I think this is what's in our mill right now. We just got it to this evening, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we have it in front of us right now. Okay. Well... <laughs> I don't know how we're going to review that if, if y'all don't have. You want to fill us in on what you. Uh, I mean, want I to have about? a copy of it here. If I want to. Well, well, we, we have it. Yeah, it just. Right. Okay. Put them on the dock. Yeah. No. We can't. We can do it. Okay. Yeah. Sir, we'd be glad to put you on for the next meeting. I'll be glad to do that. Well, the problem is, is I'm paying him to be here tonight. Okay. So that he can answer any questions that you guys have <coughs> off of his documentation that was sent through. Do you want to give us a summary of, of what, what's in here? Well, this is our ongoing problem of about two and a half years now on uh, water damage, drainage from uh, Gabriel's Crossings and Brookstone Villas. 
the two residentials that's causing problems to my property and a neighbor of mine, which is also here tonight, Mr. Mike Anglin. Uh, I've been dealing with uh, Mr. Eady and Mr. Drake for, like I said, a little over two years, and we can't seem to get anything done on it. We got close to having it dredged last year on the pond, but then uh, I received a letter more or less from the city attorney saying that it was a one-time deal. They would come out, dredge the pond, that would be it. They wouldn't be back out again, and that doesn't fix the spillway. Dredging the pond has to be done, yes, because of the problems we're having, but we also have to have the spillway widened and fixed because that's not going to fix the problems. Uh, I give you a brief overview here. I started March 16th of this year called Mr. Drake and asked him if he could get the detention pond at Brookstone Villas cleaned out. He said, yeah, no problem. I called a week later, asked again, yeah, no problem. Third week, same conversation. As of this time, before I came over tonight, it still has not been cleaned out. Now, the city had Brookstone Villas put in a I don't know if you're calling it a retention or a detention pond. I don't know which, which is the correct way, okay, for that new development on Eastern or 29th or 27th Street. But when they did it, they put in a concrete base on the bottom of it. And the problem I'm having is that's what's on the concrete. That's what I'm asking you to get clean. It's been mowed, but it hasn't taken the mud out of it. And so that's where all my silt's coming into the pond. I've got pictures upon pictures here. Uh, like I said, I, I stood before the City Planning Commission and the City Council two years ago and asked them not to approve Rookstone Villas because I cannot accept more water in this pond. We are already overflowing out the banks. And according to your engineer, there wasn't going to be a problem. We should be able to handle the water. Well, we can't handle the water. And what it's done, uh, the developer, Dur Markle, when he built our neighborhood, Bradford Court, made a concrete sidewalk around part of about half of the pond. And this only relates to my house and my next door neighbor's house. It's got the sidewalk and concrete wall. The water's overflowing out of the pond, coming into the yard. It's taking all the dirt from behind the concrete. Now the concrete, the sidewalk is falling in. It's got a crack in it, and it's just breaking away. How old are something like these? That was this spring. Like I said, Stan and Mr. Eady have both been out there. They came out in April this year. We walked the pond, we discussed things. Uh, as far as dredging the pond, they agreed with that. As far as the spillway, they wanted to get an engineer to look at it. I never had a response on that. Like I said, I've been going since March of this year again. I laid off a year because I got so mad that I quit. And then I decided, nope, I'm gonna get it done. So I started back in March this year. Uh, the last two calls I made to Mr. Drake, it was, is Mr. Drake in? Yes, he is. Can I ask who's calling? Danny Stoll. Okay, one moment. Voicemail. Last two times I got a voicemail, even though she told me he was in. So on June the 1st, I left him a little tacky message, and I told him that, you know, we've been messing since March of this year. It's June the 1st. You have till June the 15th. And all I want is something in paper, on paper, saying we will fix this and we will do this, not just our communication between us. And I said, you have till June the 15th to get this done, or I guess we'll just let the lawyers take care of it. I never heard a response from them. 
So I have talked with an attorney, and he told me my first step was to hire an engineer and have them come out, look at the pond, assess the damage and what needs to be done, which he's here tonight. I asked him to come so he could answer any questions y'all might have about the three-page document he put out. Uh, and my attorney said after that, then I'd have to hire a construction consultant to come out and tell me how much it would cost to fix the wall and all the concrete. After that, I have to file a claim. City has 90 days after that lawsuit. So I'm in step one here. I've got the engineer here to answer any questions. But once again, in, in March, when I called Mr. Drake to come out, is because it was raining hard that day. And I said, you need to come see this now when this stuff's overflowing. He did come out in the rain. I mean, I didn't see him, but he told me he came out. And he said, Danny, you're not getting that much water from Gabriel's Crossing, or uh, from Brookstone Villas, where they put that detention pond. And I said, no, I realize that. The water I'm getting from Gabriel's Crossing. He says, yeah, you're getting a maximum load from Gabriel's Crossing. Well, we found out when Gabriel's Crossing was built, the city took money in lieu of detention on that property up there. The city engineer apparently said that it wasn't needed to have a detention pond. Obviously, the city engineer is wrong because we're having all this water damage. The planning commission also told me uh, on Brookstone Villa that they were going to divert half of that water to 27th and half of that water to me. You can go stand in the entrance of that neighborhood and all that water is coming to me. I mean, it's a slope that way. You go downhill the minute you hit the neighborhood. So that was wrong. Uh, this is just something I want to show you. This is years ago. This is a tree in my backyard. This is that tree. This is before Gables Crossing. This is before Brooks Snow Villas was ever put in. If the golf course pond is full and it comes a heavy rain, it overflows it comes to me. That's the way it's designed, that's the way it's diverted to do. Before Gabriel's Crossing was there, before Brookstone Village was there, that tree that I'm showing you there is approximately 15 feet from my back door. That tree is also approximately 20 foot from the pond. And you can see how far it came up in my backyard. And that's before I had these two neighborhoods. The problem I'm having now I broke two wheels on lawnmower this year trying to mow my backyard. I can't get close to that pond with a mower. I could not, to be honest, I could not sell my house right now until I fixed that issue around that pond because somebody would break their leg trying to walk around it. There's hose everywhere. Where the dirt's gone, we don't know. But it is gone. And like I said, we've been doing this for two years and we can't seem to get any answers. So that's why I decided to come back to the council. Uh, and like I said, I've got the engineer here that he can answer you know, any questions y'all might have off of his report. Well, since he's here, you wanna, do you wanna tell us how the city is responsible? What he, what he found? I mean, he's, he's here. Yeah, I'm just curious what you, what you found. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I haven't been out there, obviously, so I'm just curious on well, what and you I, think the city... Well, when I spoke to the lady and gave her the, the copies of all this report uh, the other day, I, I told her, I said, I welcome anyone to come, you know, and walk my property. There's no dogs or anything in the backyard to look at this, because I was trying to get all this set up before we had this meeting so that we could sure, yeah, kind of sure. all be on the same page. This is Dean Khalid. Dean Khalid, Coop Engineering. Terry and uh, Danny here, Mr. and Mrs. Thor, uh, basically hire a company to come out, visually inspect the property, uh, look at the drainage basin, anything upstream to see if, uh, what was causing this flooding and the silting after uh, visual inspection and looking at some drainage plans and looking at the drainage basin. We determined that uh, you know, one visual inspection silt was coming from the Brookstone Villas property, uh, their, their pond silted in. 
the silt fence that are on the single family lots are not being maintained. It should be holding on each lot that's coming into the pond. Then when it fills up, it comes into the drainage ditch, which ends up in his backyard. So that was where the silting came in. Uh, visual inspection of the, the construction plans of Gables Crossing shows about half, the northern half of the drainage comes into the natural channel there that was natural. Then they, I think the city came out and concrete lined it to help out with the erosion because there's erosion problems. And no detention was there. So, you know, visually inspecting and looking at the plans and reports and pictures, without detention, you're increasing runoff. Runoff decreases, you know, rate of, of flow in your creeks, it causes erosion and it causes flooding downstream. That's why it's important to always detain upstream of any type of development. So there's two sources of problems. One is the erosion and the silt coming from the Brookstone Villas project and their detention pond, their detention pond. And then the actual runoff, the, the extended runoff that should have been held back is coming from the Gables Crossing. And that's kind of what's happening. To fix the problem, you know, essentially to get the silt out, you know, our recommendation to, to, to Danny, Mr. Stoll, was to dredge the pond to get the silt out and two, to expand, since you don't have any room to put a detention pond at Gables Crossing, that's been, you know, there's no land to hold that water back anymore, is to expand the outlet structure of the existing pond to help that water get out and go downstream without storing and, you know, building up in the existing pond. So essentially, that's just our observations, you know, there's no, whoever's responsibility is, that's not my job. My job was to look at the, the engineering data, the report, visual inspection based off professional engineering, and you know, our just uh, common standard practice of what I thought the problems were and what the solutions could be. Okay, so that's so kind of where I was at, and then that's where I did the report. So uh, basically we just need to dredge it and, and expand it, make the, it deeper? Yeah, the, to dredge the pond to get the silt out because it's built up there over time and then the volume goes down, so then it makes the problem worse. So if you dredge out the silt that was in there, you get the volume to be larger, and then you gotta do a drainage calculations and studies to figure out how much additional water is coming to that pond. And then you figure out basically what type of weir structure, how wider you need to make it to be able to pass that water through by maintaining a certain volume and not expanding that volume out. Okay. And essentially, once you expand that weir, anything downstream into that existing channel, it goes underneath the road. And then there's, a, I think, a concrete channel that goes down the, the other street next to, I think it's Bradford Drive, if I'm not mistaken. Then that would probably have to be looked at for, you know, make sure it's properly sized so you don't get, you know, flooding on the other side of the road. Sure. So, you know, essentially my, my recommendations are based off visual to really determine the exact, you know, values of, you know, what you need to do and the construction costs, you know, you have to run a report, do existing conditions, drain study, and a proposed conditions to figure out what, what we need to fix the problem. So. Now, will that keep the silt from coming back? The silt from coming back, you're going to need to make sure that the uh, Brookstone Village projects, they maintain their erosion control. Their silt fence, is, you know, if they have them up at each lot, that's basically the intent to keep the silt from coming in the street and going into the detention pond. If they don't maintain those, that silt just gets by it and causes the pond to build up with silt and just cause problems. So really, it's just the, the, up, the developer there needs to maintain which he should be doing anyway. Um, it's in your code that they have to do that. So he just needs to do his do his right and maintain his erosion controls, keep silt off the uh, the public right of way and out of the pond, and then that would fix that problem. And then of course dredging the pond to get rid of what's already there would be the solution to that. So. But I might also add, Brookstone Villas is almost completed now as far as each lot. So once that's done and there's grass, you know, in each yard and all that, the silting problem will basically go away as far as the silt we're having right now. It's just been for two years, we just, you know, we keep getting the silt in. We, we had tentatively agreed to address the weir issue on his pond and to dredge the pond, but in earlier discussions, that wasn't gonna be acceptable. I don't believe as far as the weir, widening it out or deepening it, no. lowering it or whatever. Yeah, we accepted. We've had, those, we've had those discussions. We accepted the widening. See, originally, engineer on staff or that you call, he wanted to drop the spillway down a foot and a half. Right. And I disagreed on that. 
because that drops my water table a foot and a half on the whole pond. And I don't want to see all that concrete wall. So I asked, why could we not widen the spillway to be double the size it is? And Mr. Anglin's agreed to give up, you know, the 10, 15 foot of his land there to do that. And why, why would that not be the same solution as dropping the spillway down, is to widen it to get more volume out? You'd have to, you can determine that, you just have to do the study to figure out. I was gonna say, he's the engineer, and I mean, I could, I could. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could, now, potentially look at the size, you sure. could, it could work for sure. It's just, you know, to keep, I know he wants to maintain that pond yeah. elevation, so sure. it's, it's widening it's, it's the solution. But, but you are right, we have agreed on some verbal things, but, there's been nothing in writing. The only thing I got in writing is when the city attorney got involved and said, we're coming out one time, one time only, and you have to sign this paper saying that whatever we do is good and you can't sue us. And I said, no, I won't sign that. Because you, at that time, you weren't even addressing the spillway. It was strictly dredging the pond. And it wasn't fixing my sidewalk and my concrete. None of that was included. I have the letter here. So that's why nothing was done there. That's why this year, since March, when I said I want something in writing telling me what we're going to do, and then I never received it, but I took the steps to hire the engineer. Now the point I'm at tonight is, yes, I've already hired him. Yes, I've already paid him. Uh, if you guys can accept this report and get something going, it'll be cheaper. If not, and he has to do all the charts and do the, you know, all the black and white as far as the volume, the flows and all that, it's just going to cost the city more because I'm expecting all this in return because this is not my fault. This was all created by the city, not by myself or Mr. Angle at all. And when this is done, when this is fixed, as far as dredging, I expect it to be stocked back with fish like it is now because all the fish are gonna die when you go dredge in the pond. And I think if the city can spend all the money for Little River to stock that pond for fishing tournaments, then we can replace the fish in my pond. And also any vegetation, which my backyard's basically grass right up against the wall in that one picture you saw. Mr. Anglin's yard, there's bushes, there's walks. There's gonna be a lot to be replaced on his. All that should be put back the same. This is not our fault. What's it with you? See what Steve will do. There's a whole lot more to it than we've even talked about sure. here tonight in terms of what we've done upstream. Um, we have relieved some of the water on that property upstream. Uh, the gentleman says he's done visual. We've done a lot of engineering on this. Uh, we basically have all the information. But I think the rub has been is that. Um, I don't think we think that all the damage to his, the walls of that pond and all of that has been caused by this, these developments upstream. That's been there 20 years, What's 15 that? or 20 years. Your pond and the walls and, no. and all that. It's, no, yeah, it's, it's been there for a long time. Yes, the pond has been there for probably 40 years yeah. as a farm pond. Right. But when Dura did this development at Bradford Court, right. that's when the pond was redesigned. Yeah. That's when the pond had the concrete walls added. Yes. That's when the spillway was put in. Right. Other than that, it was just a farm pond. I'm saying that was some time ago, 12, 15 years, whatever it was. It's probably been 12 years ago now, yes. Well, I mean, I know it was longer than that. Well, was you're the, right, yeah. It was in I, the mid, I've been there 12 years. It was so in the mid-90s. Probably 15. Probably 15. Yeah. But the thing is, is there wasn't any problem until we got Gables Crossing. That's, and that's always been the drainage basin there. All the water from the golf course, all that water upstream has always come across your property. There's never been any water upstream, Mr. Eby. There was two, there was a pond on the development that Brooks Fellville has put in. They wiped that pond out when they made that development over there. My point is I think we don't necessarily agree with the extent of damage to that wall. We've been willing to dredge and we've been willing to adjust that the weir. And I'm saying we would do that now. But as far as rebuilding this pond, I don't think we think that's entirely the city's responsibility. Okay, so, so, so we have, obviously we've looked into it and that engineer work and stuff. Oh yeah, there's a lot of work that's been done. And this is Mr. Anglin, he's my 
Um, There's basically two of us that, that this wall concerns. That's, that's what I was on. There's four of us that uh, border the pond, but there's only two of us this wall concerns. So that's part of the reason why we're here. I just want to make a few points. Uh, talking about the property that widened the spillway, that was contingent upon repairing the sidewalk and all my plantings. The only other point I wanted to say is, if it rained real hard tonight and the water from the street undermined your driveway, whose fault would it be? Because that's simply what's happened on our property. Okay? Doesn't matter how long it's been. It's been undermined, just like if it hadn't at your property tonight. Does that make sense? I understand what you're saying. Okay. It depends on whether the driveway's in the right of way or on your personal property. Well, I'm saying if it gets up on your property and tears up your property, which is what it did to ours. And it's been like that for a while. It didn't just happen yesterday. It's been like that for quite a while. The sidewalk is about to lay over and edge up. Right. Randy, can we fix it for him? That's a legal question, I guess, huh? Without knowing more about the advice we get to the direction of knowing it's about to end right now without the rest of at this point in time management decision. Uh, I need to know more about the what has been done upstream, what uh, you know any other developers have done. I can't answer these questions. Well, the reason I asked because he said this is the first step in his lawsuit against the city, so as of that part, it becomes your problem rather than mine once he says he's doing lawsuit, and you and Steve will have to work this out with him. Since I mean, he's missing that. Isn't that correct under the charter? I've been in Moore for 48 years. I was raised here, owned several houses. Uh, I've got a wife teaching school, got a son that's next door over at Central Junior High as a coach and a teacher. I mean, I'm. this is not something I want to do, believe right. me. I'm just and trying that's to why it's prolonged it. for two years, but it's just to the point that I feel like I'm being railroaded and we're not getting anything done. And, and I'm trying to help you, but mm -hmm. I have a lot of landmines to walk through, so to speak, on this, because I don't want to be in violation of the charter. I don't want my city council to be in violation of the charter. I, you know, what, what I think would be yeah. beneficial and is, uh, and again, I apologize for the delay here, but I think it'd be beneficial if you all could go out and look if you like. Um, we can come up with a drawing and some maps that show what all we're talking about here. Show the drainage basin. We've already done a lot of work out there. Um, and Stan's been out there a dozen times, I know at least in the last uh, two or three years and every, every rain when it rains. Um, um, and has a lot of information on this. I think we can give you a better understanding of what's out there, what has happened over time, when it happened, and all that, and we can do that at the next meeting. I would like maybe for somebody to look at this engineering report uh, from the city sure. that is, uh, and look at it and give us their opinion, their uh, thoughts just, on it. I, I, I read through it, and from what the gentleman said there, as far as his observations, that the weir needs to be taken care of and it needs to be dredged. We don't disagree with that. Right. There's other issues that, um, the gentleman is concerned with as far as damage to the property that okay. needs to be determined. Well, and I definitely want to come out there and, and look at it and read through this myself. And you know, we just got this tonight, so I haven't had it. I'm just getting hit with all of this at once. So okay. you're welcome. And like I said, anyone's welcome anytime to come out there and walk it and see what it looks like. I want you to understand that we want to do what's right here. Yeah. You know, we're not. It's not us against you. We just have a responsibility to make sure the taxpayer dollars get spent. My well, I realize that, so. but you know, you need to look at my vantage point that I've been dealing with this for over two years. Oh, I understand. And I understand. Granted, yes, pressure. Mr. Drake's been out there a dozen times. What's happened? Nothing. Something went out. I don't think but that's I mean, exactly you know, true. Two We've years. done a lot of work out there north of you. Nothing, nothing's been done on my property, Mr. On Eden. your property. That's okay. what I'm asking for. There's been a lot of work done out there. There's been a lot of money spent by the city upstream from there. Yeah, the city to, came out last to year the and, of water and put the concrete flow. drainage for my also, neighbors. We also did work on the golf course property. Yeah. North of there, we pulled a, a um, tin horn out that effectively reduced the amount of water coming off of the golf course through your property by half. 
We created a tension facility on the golf course property that wasn't there before. So we have to have the whole story out okay. here, not just I, part of the story. I agree with you there. But everything you just said, all that was done. We've been in a drought for two years. That golf course hasn't came to me. And you can see by my pictures what water I have coming out of my banks in the spring without the golf course even coming to me. So everything you've done at the golf course might be great in the future when it overflows. But it's not the issue right now. It's Gabriel's Crossing that's creating this problem that we're showing. Yes, you've done a lot of work up there. I agree, you have. And you put the, con the concrete channel in our bar ditch, which is great for my neighbors, because now they can mow. There's no erosion. What's that do for me? It brings the water to me faster. That's all it does. It channels it one nice spot and brings it to me faster. But everything that was done on the golf course doesn't affect what happened last year. That's all Gabriel's Crossing. You, I mean, the pictures show the flooding that I'm having. He'll get the information to us, and we'll look it over and, and talk about this. Thing. Are you gonna try to put this on the agenda so we can talk about it then? Or? Yeah. Okay. So okay. We'll talk about it next week or two weeks. Two weeks. Uh, get those back. Absolutely. Yes. Anybody else? Guys, yeah, good. I wasn't even afraid to say that. All right. Item B is. It? Items from uh, City Council or Trustees? I have, I have one. Uh, Jerry, just good to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks. The uh, uh, water power is uh, by the First Baptist Church of Moore. It's my understanding that the cell towers that are on top of it are no longer being used. Is that? They've uh, submitted documentation to us to ask to terminate the lease. So, yeah, I don't know whether they're in use today or not, but they yeah. are not going to be in use, yes. And will the, uh, will the city try to, to sell that or market that, or is it just if somebody's interested, they would contact us and say, hey, we would like to lease the top of the tower? We, we've not ever really marketed it whenever there was a pretty huge expansion of those. The, they were coming to us left and right, uh, um, but we've not ever really marketed it as far as I can. So you, you don't, if somebody comes to the city, then we would consider it, but you're not going out looking for somebody to... Yeah, I wouldn't, I mean, I don't know that we really even know who to other than just the major carriers, of yeah. course. So, but yeah, I think it is, that lease is terminated. Okay. Anybody else? Any items from the city manager or trust manager? Just a couple of items. Um, um, I'd like Steve Hoffner to come forward. Stan, if you can pass those um, out. Steve is our traffic engineer, and his company is the one who designed the uh, traffic signals at uh, 5th and I-35, and there's been some questions about that. Uh, <laughs> and so we asked Steve to come in, and uh, he's got his bulletproof vest on underneath um, his uh, shirt there that uh, give you an understanding of how that's supposed to work. Um, and what's uh, the rationale behind the, the way it was uh, developed. Thank you, Steve. Um, and then he's gonna give us a real quick um, update on our um, um, timing and our getting all the traffic signals on 19th Street to operate uh, together, so. Thank you. <coughs> Mayor and City Council. Mr. Eady asked me to come in this evening and explain the way and, and what for the traffic signal uh, is operating at the intersections of I-35, Telephone Road, and uh, Fifth, Northwest Fifth Street. There are, uh, the traffic signal equipment's a pretty sophisticated piece of equipment nowadays, and there's a lot of different ways that you can operate intersections that are very closely spaced. In this particular case, we've got three intersections that uh, are closely spaced and as a result we look at the traffic volumes to determine whether we can stack traffic in between those intersections. The first sheet that I have on the diagrams has a red hatched area and those are the two areas where we would want to keep the traffic cleared out of that area if uh, at all possible. In the calculations what we look at is turning traffic if they fill up the middle for example underneath the bridge between the two I-35 ramps and at a number of times during the day 
it would fill those areas up if we did not phase the signals such that we could keep those areas clear obviously the short distance between the telephone road and the southbound I-35 frontage road is so short that there's no way you could stack traffic in there what I did then on subsequent diagrams is to show the various movements of traffic through the intersection and where they could potentially turn the diagrams are also in order of how the signal is currently operating for the second figure two eastbound traffic has could turn at telephone road I-35 southbound frontage road or the I-35 northbound frontage road and so what we do with the traffic signals is once they make one signal as we allow them then to continue on through the other intersection on a green line I'll come back and show you one other thing in just a minute then telephone road is the second one in sequence and again we've set the traffic signals up such that they can clear the I-35 ramp on the east side of the intersection the next one is the southbound I-35 ramp and they've got several different options you can see how complicated those movements can potentially be they could go straight on the frontage road or they could make a right turn and then a quick left turn on telephone road that's why that intersection needs to be kept clear or they can turn left and that movement is fairly heavy especially during p.m. peak hour and at some other hours of the day figure five then is the westbound direction coming underneath the bridge and they can turn left at either the south frontage road or on telephone road and then the final movement is the eastbound I'm sorry the northbound frontage road again if they make the left turn they clear both of the intersections one of the reasons that the signal is phased this way is that the reward for having to wait just a little bit of extra time because we're we're sequencing each one of these as they go through the intersections is that once you do get a green light you're able to clear all the other intersections you don't have to for example on this last diagram turn left and then come up to the southbound frontage road and stop and wait until you have the opportunity to go through there it's also a bit of a safety reason for doing that there can be some driver expectancy that they'll have the green light there and if they don't have the green light there then they can potentially run through those traffic signals so there is obviously when you sequence through an operation like that there is a little extra time that individuals have to wait but once they get the green light then they're able to clear through all of the intersections the signal is set up if you'll flip back for example on figure five for both east and west on I'll just explain the westbound direction when the figure four shows you that the the southbound ramp is right before the westbound movement the way that the traffic signal is phased is we look at how much traffic is on that southbound ramp and we go ahead and start the westbound through movement when we are able to determine when the southbound traffic is going to get so that they actually get the green light and that southbound ramp stays on until such time as they approach that intersection then they get the green light and that same thing is true on the eastbound direction to add to the efficiency we have continued to tweak the the traffic timings out there it's a it's not an exact science and even went back there this evening to watch it and it's got to adjust to all different types of patterns and, and we're trying to to make it as efficient as possible uh, I believe that one other thing the what I think where most of the complaints are coming is that the east side or the northbound ramp they don't see what's going on over on the west side and they don't see the potential cars coming to them and so they they assume that there's a lot of dead time or delay time in that traffic movement we could make a, a slight change to it but again I think that it's more of a safety issue and my preference would be to leave it phased the way that it is and continue to work on the signal timing and I, I think over time the uh, complaints will come down and it uh, the efficiency of the intersection the safety of it will override uh, some of the delay out there you don't know our citizens do you <laughs> <laughs> I I do know what you're talking about well yeah you, you're, and you're right that that's I, I've been there twice and it seemed like it was 20 minutes with no cars crossing the direction you know and so but it makes sense looking at your picture here though I mean that's a complicated area yeah you know, but 
Uh, but yeah, you're right. That's the area that I think would be the the area that would get the it gets the most complaints. Right. Do you know what the time? <coughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, probably the whole thing will cycle in about 120 seconds, which is fairly normal for a, a major intersection. That we run them in about 120 second cycle, but it seems like a long time because you're yeah, sitting Are you, are you sure about that? that? I, I timed it the other night, and that's about what I timed it. Yeah. yeah. Last week we made some, last week it was, it was cycling longer than that, and I made some changes last week and I, oh, cut, okay. I cut it down. Yeah, because it was about 20 minutes last time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got me there. <laughs> any other questions on that intersection? Is there any way that we could put a big blow up right next to the intersection so people see why we're doing this? Blow up the beach diagram? Yeah. Yes. Each page. Hey, thank, just, you, thank you very much. Appreciate they it. They would just look at it and say, you know, the cars only go the same way they went before we did it. They Is go it the same direction. Safer? Have there been any, I mean, what was it like before all of this accident wise? There wasn't any wrecks there anyway. Yeah, four way stops, <laughs> two people have to make, I always yeah. say, two people have to make a, a mistake at a four way stop, and it, it really did. The safety record was pretty good prior to that. Um, <clears throat> it, we don't know, it'll take some time. We usually look at about a year's worth of history. Probably clears that area out quicker though, that east west. Yeah, the southbound in the evenings and, and in the mornings, there's some approaches that are very heavy. And it's, it, it's, they may not think it, but they are getting through there faster. That, that uh, deal with Telephone Road, that was always <coughs> tricky to maneuver your way through there. I mean, that was so not, not a good deal. The local knowledge helped the safety <laughs> record there because it, it was a little bit unorthodox. Yes, What's your philosophy on roundabouts? I think that they have a, a very a good application in a lot of different areas. Where we still have a bit of a challenge uh, are on real heavy intersections where you have to have two lanes coming in. They've worked in some locations throughout the United States with, with two lane approaches, but uh, if we have traffic that we can uh, narrow it down to a single lane, they're very efficient and have a, a great safety record to them. They're a little less pedestrian. I've lived in England for several years and was a big fan of roundabouts. We're going back in a couple of weeks, so I may come back with a new <laughs> new fever for roundabouts. Great. Great. We're still actually looking for a application here and more that a roundabout would work on. They're really a good um, application for in front of um, schools where there's a lot of traffic going one way and a lot of traffic coming out the other way. So we may think about that for our next schools that go in. Unless you drive them on one and you've never been on one before. They're, they're, they're I went to, I've been to New Zealand, and the first couple we hit, I wasn't sure we were driving the right direction. They're like a four-way stop where nobody stops. It's a exactly. four-way yield. That's the best way to explain them. It's a, a bit of an aside, but up in Colorado at uh, Breckenridge and Vail and, and some of those interstate ramps that come off and you've got very directional traffic, they put them in there, and it has resolved significant issues with those. But th this is not those locations. There are places here that they would Maybe we can research that. Thank you. Uh, real quick on 19th, on 19th Street. Uh, we've got the traffic signals along 19th. We've been limping along. What happens is we put, we can put coordinated timing into those intersections. But unless they have continual communications between the intersections, they've got time clocks in them that are supposed to be fairly accurate. But they, they drift over a course of a month or two, and if they get five to ten seconds out, then all of a sudden your coordination doesn't look as good anymore. We've been in the process here in the last month or two to do two things, is to get the communications link repaired, and I think we're within a week or two of having that resolved, and also to get a telephone drop in where we have the master that's controlling all those intersections so that we'll be able to communicate from our office and check them even on a daily basis to see if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, there's one other issue at Fretz. They uh, got some loop problems there and uh, the city has made the decision to go with video detection. Uh, the, the equipment's ordered to take about 30 days to get that in. We've done all the, the new counts, we've uh, developed the new patterns and we'll be implementing those probably in the next 30 to 45 days to uh, help with uh, coordination along 
19th Street. In the meantime, we'll try to keep them in step the best that we can. That'll go from 19th and Broadway all the way over to Santa Fe or to Cripps. Well, I think Stan said it, we've got it clear to Santa Fe. So if, if we could get communications there, we'll make it all the way to Santa Fe. So hopefully within the next 30 to 45 days, we'll have that all linked up all the way through there. You know, I'm, I'm not promising a it's, Rose Garden either, but yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be, be better. Yeah, because the close proximity of the intersections, but it'll definitely, it's definitely, you can tell a difference when those signals are working together and when they're not. You can also tell the difference when motorcycle cops sitting out there. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody seems to obey it a lot better. <laughs> they do a good job of enforcement. Other questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Item 10 is adjournment. Two more things from there. Oh. A couple more things quickly. <laughs> Sorry. First off, I wanted to just introduce you all to Greg Herbster. Greg is going to be assuming the position of our deputy chief in the fire department. Greg's been with the department about 22 years now. He was a Moore High School graduate, uh, done well. He's uh, advancing from the major's position, uh, taking uh, Gary's position as the deputy chief now that Gary's stepped in, stepped in the chief's position. So we're uh, happy to have him and excited about uh, his promotion and his uh, leadership in the department. And Deidre's got a quick announcement. Super quick. We won. We just keep winning all these awards. So we won, of course, the 77th Best Place to Live from uh, Money Magazine. So that's exciting. It's gotten a lot of publicity. And then we also won the chance to have KOCO5 back here for their On the Road Tour next week. So they will be here all day on Thursday, September the 15th. And we will start them out at the library. And then we will have a huge lunch for them and you will all be invited as soon as I make up those invitations I will get them to you they just announced the winners like two days ago so we just found out like about two days ago um, then we will go to the senior center we will visit um, the firefighters as they are preparing for their second or like well they're they've been doing Santa Express for many many years but um, in conjunction with the community there will be a poker run um, that leaves from Fort Har Thunder Harley so we're going to visit them and help them get ready for that and then we will visit the food pantry at Moore High School and then we will be at Moore High Stadium all evening on Thursday September the 13th um, for live broadcasts at 5 and 6 so we want the entire community to come out and I will keep all of this posted up on the website the minute it becomes absolutely official and the minute these people know that we're coming <laughs> and that I order the food for the lunch and all so anyway it's going to be kind of a tight schedule but we're going to make it happen. It's going to be a great day. So that is next Thursday, September the 13th. Thanks. All right. Now I understand. Mrs. Derringer. So moved. All right. Second. Thank you both. Office vote. Kathy Griffith. Yes. Carrie Kavner. Yes. David Roberts. Yes. Mark Ham. Yes. Robert Krause. Yes. Jason Blair. Yes. Glenn Lewis. Yes, we are adjourned. Thank you for coming.